We're so glad that you're listening to the Wednesday night Bible study. And uh, I'd like to speak tonight on a verse in Ephesians 4 and verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let's pray together. Uh, Lord, thank you for the privilege of studying your word. Uh, the Bible tells us that, that your word is profitable. And so may it profit our lives as we apply it. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the major themes that the Apostle Paul stresses in his epistles, in his letter especially to the Ephesians, is that of unity. He says, keeping the unity of the Spirit. The church at Ephesus was composed of uh, saved both Jews and Gentiles, uh, and they were often at odds with one another in the church, in the assembly. Usually the trouble lay with the Jewish believers, and the reason was that they, Jewish believers thought that they were better than the Gentile believers. Back in the Old Testament, the Jews, of course, were the people of God. And so they would wrap their robes of self-righteousness around themselves and say, ours are the commandments, ours the right of circumcision, ours is the temple here in Jerusalem, ours are the covenants. And the Gentiles were considered to be outcasts and actually called dogs. But now in the New Testament, the Gentiles are a part of the church. They're part of the program of God. In God's eyes, there's no longer any difference between the Jew and the Gentile. Paul points up the unity between Jew and Gentile uh, here in chapters 2 and 3 of, of uh, Ephesians. He says the Gentiles, uh, they were once far off from the Jews, but now they're brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ, Ephesians 2.13. There is now peace between the Jew and Gentile, 2.14. Jesus has broken down the wall that separated Jew from the Gentile. He has taken two peoples and from them has made one new man, Ephesians 2.15. Both Jew and Gentile are now, they now have access to God through the church. Gentiles are no longer strangers to the Jews, but fellow citizens and part of the household of faith, chapter 2 and verse 19. Together, Paul says, the Jews and Gentiles form one spiritual building, chapter 2 and verse 22. And again, the Jews and Gentiles are both heirs of the same promises, chapter 3 and verse 6. One more time, both groups, Jew and Gentile, are now a part of the same family, the family of God, chapter 3 and verse 15. So Paul is stressing unity here as he writes to the Ephesian church. In God's eyes, there's now unity between Jew and the Gentile. They are now one and the church, and there's no longer any difference between them. But in the eyes of the Jews, this unity was not necessarily so. I mean, how could they instantly accept the people uh, that they had despised for 2,000 years? How do they accept them now suddenly as being equal? Someone has said to dwell above with saints we love, oh, that will be glory. But to dwell below with saints we know, well, that's a different story. And that's the way it was with the church at Ephesus. Up in glory, God was saying, the Jews and Gentiles, they're now one in the church. So dwell together in unity. While down here on the earth, the Jews and Gentiles were each other's throat because Jewish believers were reluctant to accept the Gentiles as equals. So Paul emphasizes this message of unity, this message of peace. In chapter 4 and verse 4 of Ephesians, Paul says there is one body. So as we talk about the church being the one body, there are two main thoughts I want us to consider. Roman rule 1, the body and relationship to Jesus Christ. The church and relationship to Jesus Christ. So capital A, Jesus is the head of the body. Ephesians 1, and 23, and hath put all things under his feet, Jesus' feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness that filleth all in all. The church, that is all who are truly saved uh, by the blood of the Lamb, that they form the body of Christ, of which our Lord Christ, he is the head. Paul tells the Colossians the same thing he tells the Ephesians, 
and he, Jesus, is the head of the body, which is his church. Now, a body needs the head to tell it how to function. Our brain, of course, located in our head, tells the rest of our body what to do. The body depends upon its head. If your finger touches a hot stove, it automatically removes itself. But in reality, the brain has sent a message down through the spinal cord to the finger that says that burner is hot. Don't touch it. Or if your foot steps on a nail or a tack, uh, that foot immediately removes itself. But in reality, the brain has sent a message to the foot in a split second, saying the nail, the tack is sharp. Don't put your weight upon it. You see, we take all of this for granted, but every function of the body is performed under the direction of the head. And even now, as I speak, each time I move my jaws as I talk or uh, use my vocal cords, every time I make a gesture with my hands, it is my head telling my vocal cords what to say. It is my head telling my hands how to gesture. So in the physical realm, the body is in subjection to the head. And in the spiritual realm, the body of Christ, his church, needs to be in subjection to its head, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, perhaps you say, well, you know, I understand I'm a part of the church, I'm a part of the body of Jesus Christ, but how do I know what my head, Jesus Christ, wants me to do? And the good news is that Christ has told us everything we need to know uh, how to function as a church, as a, as a part of the body in his word. This is God's word, and it tells us how we are to function. The Bible is God's inspired, literally God-breathed book, all scripture given by inspiration of God. The Bible is inerrant. That means it is without error. And Jesus said that one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all the scriptures be fulfilled. The Bible is powerful. The word of God is quick. That means life-giving and powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. But there's another truth about the Bible. It is sufficient for all of our needs. It makes the man of God perfect. Paul says per that means mature and thoroughly furnished for every good work. And so uh, we, we see here the sufficiency of the word of God. Alexander Duff a missionary to India back in the 1800s. Uh, he went to work as a, as a young missionary uh, with William Carey. Carey was a founder of modern missions. So back during the early 1800s, uh, books were very few and books were expensive. But Alexander Duff, he was a scholar. He was a graduate of Cambridge uh, University, very uh, prestigious school. And he possessed 800 books, 800 volumes in his library. And that was a lot of books back 200 years ago. So as the ship that was carrying Duff with, and his possessions, as it sailed into the harbor there in Bombay, India, suddenly the ship sank and Duff lost all of his possessions and especially and including his 800 volumes, books. He was heartbroken. He stood on the shore uh, as the ship as it sank beneath the waters there of that bay, heartbroken. And suddenly he saw something that was floating to shore. He ran over to retrieve it, and it turned out to be his Bible. But you see, back there in the 1800s, Bibles that they had thick wooden covers and then a metal clasp that, that kept them together. Uh, and so they were, because of the wood they, covers, they were able to float. And so out of the 800 uh, volumes, 800 books that he brought with him to India, only one survived, and that was his Bible. Uh, he took it as if God was telling to him, Alexander, the one book that you really need is this book, the Bible. And so it is all sufficient for our needs. Capital A, Jesus is the head of the body, and he tells us what to do in his word. Capital B, Jesus, he's also the Savior of the body. Ephesians 5:23 tells us that Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. When our son Ryan was 5 years of age, uh, we took our kids for a swim. We had a swimming pool up in New York in our backyard. It was a hot summer's day. 
And so Ryan, he happened to be sitting on the edge of the swimming pool, and he fell into the water. Now the water was only four feet deep, but Ryan was only three feet tall. And so uh, he was in over his head. He was taken in water quickly. Linda screamed, and I ran, and I just reached down, and I pulled him out of the water. He choked a little bit, and he cried, but he was fined. But Randy, our older son, was about 11 years of age, and Randy cried out, he drowned, he drowned, and Ryan panicked, I drowned, am I going to die? You see, Ryan was sinking, and I reached down, and I rescued him out of the waters that overwhelmed him. So you and I, the Bible says we were sinking in our sin, but Jesus reached down, and he rescued us, and he saved us. The old song says, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Now what did Jesus Christ do to save his body, the church? He paid a tremendous price to save us. He paid his own precious blood. Now there's a prison out in Texas, and if you're a prisoner and you're willing to give a pint of your blood, it will uh, it will remove 30 days from your sentence. If you donate blood every time, it is 30 days off your sentence. In effect, you see, their, their blood was helping to purchase their freedom. And while the blood of Jesus Christ has purchased our freedom, uh, Peter says, for as much as you know, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Not just blood, but the precious blood of Christ. Now, we call gold and silver precious metals. But you know, God says silver and gold, they're not really precious. They will perish. But the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, is precious because it can redeem. Nor silver nor gold has uh, obtained my redemption. No riches on earth could have saved my poor soul. The blood of the cross is my only foundation. And the blood of my Savior now maketh me whole. So I've been redeemed, but not with silver. I've been bought, but not with gold. Bought with the price, the blood of Jesus, precious blood of love untold. So A, Jesus is the head of the body. B, Jesus is the Savior of the body. And then capital C, Jesus, he baptizes us into his body, the church. Do you remember what John the Baptist said? Uh, about the, uh, when Jesus was baptized, uh, John said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he, Christ, shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 tells us the same thing. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether it be Jew or Gentile, bond or free, we've all been made to drink into one spirit. Jesus baptizes, the Holy, baptizes us with the Holy Spirit when we are saved. Now, this is not necessarily some emotional experience by which we must speak in tongues, but rather it is an induction. It is a placing of that believer into the body of Jesus Christ. Do you realize there's only one verse in the entire Bible which explains and defines the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what it really is? And we read here the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that act by which the believer is placed into Christ's body, which is the universal church at the time of his salvation. For by one spirit are we all baptized, placed, inducted into one body. I had a charismatic uh, man um, in the charismatic movement uh, raise his eyebrows and he said to me sanctimoniously on one occasion with a deep voice, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I answered, I sure have. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit when I was saved because I was placed into the universal church, into the body of Jesus Christ. And I quoted this verse, for by one spirit we're all baptized into one body. Actually, the Greek word is past tense. For, we, uh, by, for by one spirit were we all baptized into one spirit. So some Bible teachers believe, they think that we are all baptized in the body of Christ on the day of Pentecost. When, uh, w when the Holy Spirit came, they, they think, well, that baptism took place corporately, the whole body of Christ 
baptized into the Holy Spirit then. But most Bible teachers believe that, that, uh, that it's not a collective baptism, but it is, it is individual. At the time of salvation, we are placed, inducted, baptized into Christ's body. But it is past tense. Every believer, everyone who was saved has been baptized, placed, inducted into Christ's body, which is his church. Now, at salvation, we are placed into the universal church. At baptism, water baptism, we are placed into the local church. So Jesus, A, he's the head of the body. B, he's the savior of the body. C, he baptizes us into his body. And then capital D, Jesus is the life of the body. Even though there are many members of Christ's body, we must all partake of the same spiritual food, the same spiritual bread. What was that spiritual bread? Of course, our Lord told us. He said, I am the bread of life. And except you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life in you. Jesus is the staff of life. He is the bread that, that gives life to the church. So we must partake. That means that we must believe and trust in him. The Puritans, they actually spoke about feasting on Jesus Christ, the bread of life. The song says, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. So friend, if you are hungry, if you thirst after something that will satisfy the longings of your heart, then you need to partake of Jesus Christ, the living bread. So when Jesus fed the multitudes, you remember along the shores of Galilee, he had 5,000 followers who immediately uh, he fed them. He, they wanted to take him by force and make him their king. But when Jesus turned to them and told what it was like to be his disciple, when he said, except you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life in you, the same multitude said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And so uh, the scripture tells us from that time, many of his disciples went back and they walked with him no more. And then he's back to the original 12. And he turns to them and says, will you also go away? And Peter makes that great declaration. Lord, to whom shall we go? For thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and we are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Salvation is narrow because it comes only through the bread of life, Jesus Christ. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So Roman rule one, the body in relationship to Christ. Now Roman rule two, the body in relationship to itself. So capital A, there is one body but many members. First Corinthians 12, 20 tells us that. But now are they many members, yet one body? Just as our physical body has many members, many parts. I mean, we got fingers and toes and arms and legs. We got many parts, uh, yet one body. So likewise, the body of Jesus Christ is one, but it has many parts, many members. Uh, I think when I watch the Winter Olympics that the most beautiful competition is the figure skating. So whether it's an individual skating or a couple skating together, it is so graceful. They make their moves and their jumps and rhythm to the music. And it seems as though the women uh, figure skaters, they not only capture the gold for the United States, the gold medal, but they sometimes capture the heart of the nation as well. I think of people like Peggy Fleming and Dorothy Hamill, uh, who won the gold but also won her hearts. But every muscle and every part of their body, it is moving in perfect choreography, coordination, synchronization. And that is how the body of Christ, the church, should function as well. Ephesians 4.16, For whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Paul says every part of the body should effectually work together with the rest of the body in love. That's the ideal. That's the way it should be. Paul said to the Corinthians that there should be no schism, there should be no division in the body of Christ. But sometimes there are schisms and there are divisions that develop. For example, Paul addresses a division that took place in the church at Philippi. 
In Philippians 4, 2, he says, I beseech, I beg you, Odious, and I beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Uh, here are two ladies in a church at Philippi. You remember the story. Uh, they were disruptive. They were, they were squabbling, Euodius and Syntyche. They couldn't get along with one another. It was affecting the church. Harry Ironside, the, the great preacher at Moody Church, all oh, back in the 1900s, he spoke of Euodius and Syntyche, you remember, as odious and soon touchy. There are some Christians who are odious. That means obnoxious. Uh, they are loud, obnoxious, offensive, pushy. They've got to have their own way, my way or the highway. Uh, they don't care whose feelings are hurt. They're like a bull in a china shop. Some Christians are cantankerous. Someone said, have you ever noticed that a narrow mind and a wide mouth seem to go together? I read an article about a cantankerous old lady. As she walked into a department store one day. Well, she was startled when this dignified executive runs up to her and he pins an orchid on her dress, hands her a crisp $100 bill, TV cameras are focused on her, the band begins to play that is there, stars and stripes forever, ah, da, 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 da. and the microphone is, is shoved in front of her and she was told, uh, you are the one millionth customer that has come into our store. Customer number one, million. And so we want to honor you. So tell us, just why did you come into our store today? She answered, well, I was on my way to the complaint department. Some people are odious. They're, they're complainers. Someone has said, when you're tempted to tell others your troubles, remember, one half of your listeners are not even interested, and the other half are glad that you're finally getting what you deserve. Uh, some people are odious, like Euodius. Some people are soon touchy, like Syntyche. They're always getting their feelings hurt, crying the blues. Or perhaps they can get their own way and say, I'm going to take my dollies and dishes and go home. Perhaps they say, people are not friendly to me. When I pastored in my last church in, in New York State, where I was at for, for 12 years uh, before coming here, uh, we had a lady in our church, and she called me up on the phone one day and said, Pastor, I want you to know I am not coming to your church anymore. And so I said, why not? What happened? Oh, she said, the people in your church, they don't practice what you preach. Uh, I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you, 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 practice, you preach about friendliness. You preach friendliness, but, but no one in the church is friendly to me. But, you know, I observed this lady uh, in the church over a period of time. She would always come in and sit alone by herself. She talked to no one. She looked just straight ahead. She looked like she was sucking on lemons. Her attitude was, I dare anyone to come up to me and be friendly. Well, the Bible says if we want to have friends, what? We must be friendly ourselves. Some people are hurt and offended. They're soon touchy uh, because they cannot accept constructive criticism. I don't agree much with uh, Norman Vincent Peale. He was, of course, a liberal preacher in the 1900s. Someone said that Paul's doctrine was appealing, but Peale's doctrine was appalling. But he made a statement that I do agree with. He said the trouble with most of us is that we would rather be ruined by praise than saved by criticism. He was right. We, nerd, we need to learn to handle criticism, and as, as not only praise, but to handle criticism as well. So Roman number two, the body in relationship to itself, capital A, there's one body, many members, and then capital B, there needs to be care in the body. Again, Paul says to the Corinthians that there should be no schism, no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. Not divisions, but care. Then he adds, if one member suffer, we all suffer. If one member is honored, we all rejoice. There's an interesting example of that in the book of Hebrews. Now, the Hebrew Christians were being persecuted unmercifully by their own countrymen, the fellow Jews. So the author of the book of Hebrews, he writes to the Jewish Christians at Jerusalem, and he says to them, remember them that are in, bound, in, that are in bonds bound with them, and remember them who suffer adversity as being yourselves also 
in the body. So the author of Hebrews is teaching body truth, just like the Apostle Paul. He says, since we're all a part of the same body, the body of Christ, therefore we also, if, if, if we have a brother in prison, we're spiritually in prison with him. If a brother is suffering uh, physically or uh, persecution, then we suffer with him. He's our brother in Christ. We're part of the same body. So do we have care uh, about others in the church who may be going through hard times. Several centuries ago, the Swiss, they were revolting against the Austrians. Uh, they wanted to gain their independence. Um, and so there was, during that war, there was a father who had three sons. The father and three sons, they all served together in the Swiss army. So one day the father, he gathers his, his three sons before him, and he presents them with a bundle of sticks, and they're tied together with a rope. And the father throws out the challenge, which one of you can break this bundle of sticks? So the first son, he, he put the bundle of sticks across his knee and tried to break it with his knee, but he failed to break it. The second son took the bundle of sticks, he put it behind his back and tried to break it, pressing it against his back, but he failed. The third son, he put the uh, bundle of sticks up against the tree, and he ran and he jumped against the bundle of sticks on the tree, but he too failed to break the bundle of sticks. So the father said, let me show you how to do it. So the old man, he took the bundle of sticks, and you know what he did? He untied them, he untied the bundle, and he broke the sticks easily one by one. Well, the sons protested and said, anyone can break the bundle of sticks one by one, but no one can break the bundle of sticks if they're tied together. And the father said, exactly, that's my point. We are now in a struggle for our freedom. So if we stand united, no one can break us. But if we're divided, we can be broken one by one. And Christian, Satan can break us as a church one by one. But if we stand together united, Jesus said that the gates of hell cannot stand against the church. In the ancient Greek city of Thebes, uh, there, was, there were 300 cavalrymen. These 300 soldiers, uh, they could not be defeated. You see, they were companions who had made a vow to one another that they would stand together and fight together until the last drop of them uh, spilled upon the ground. And they were known as the sacred battalion. So may our church also be a sacred battalion bound together in the love of Christ. So Paul tells us in Ephesians why he says the church uh, is a body that shall never die. And the church is a building that shall never be destroyed. The church is a bride that shall never be divorced. And the church is a battalion that shall never be defeated. And so, friend, let me ask you, are you a part of the body of Jesus Christ? Have you received him as your personal Savior? Romans 6.23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, now take this word and may we apply what we have learned uh, as a church to have that unity, that love, that care for one another. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.